So once again, my name is Ian. I'm from the Experience, Strength, and Hope group of CODA in Saskatoon, Canada. My privilege to be here today and talking about boundaries. Um, I'm just putting my phone on the ground because it's ringing. Somebody's trying to get hold of me. Um, so uh, let me just start by saying um, I'm a recovering codependent, just like everybody else here on Zoom. And uh, I'm not an expert in boundaries. What I'm sharing is my experience, strength, and hope. Um, so please uh, take what you like and leave the rest. Uh, I do want to warn that I have no experience with sexual or physical abuse. Um, and I've learned through uh, doing boundaries work I actually started back doing presentations and working with groups specifically on boundaries back in 2007. Uh, it was um, made known to me by somebody in one of my groups at one point that uh, for safety's sake, you really need to get some help for an expert from an expert before you start setting boundaries with people uh, who may be prone to violence, right? I don't have that background. I cannot give you uh, experience from my point of view on that. All I can do is say, please, please, please. It's important that if you're in an unsafe environment, before you start setting boundaries, that you get expert help. Because sometimes setting boundaries with people who are prone to violence will lead to violence. So I just wanted to start with that. Those disclaimers. Um, for those of you who know me, I am the kind of person who spends a lot of time standing up at a whiteboard. And uh, Zoom allows me to sort of do that here with you guys. So I'm going to throw up a whiteboard. And what I want to draw is what we're going to be talking about today. So passive, assertive, and aggressive boundaries. And uh, I'm going to set this up so I can see what I'm sharing. Hopefully, you can still see the whiteboard there. I just moved it. Yes. All right. So I'm just going to draw on this little tablet here. Pick a pen. Yes, it's starting to show up, I think. OK, I'm just going to draw a person here. And uh, <clears throat> if you're a codependent like me, you have all these other people that come to talk to you, um, interact with you, um, and they start asking you to do all these different things for them. And they're coming to you making all kinds of demands of your time, your talent, your treasure. And what do we say to all of them? We say yes. Sorry, yes. I'm sorry, Ian, to, just to interrupt you, sorry. Um, I can't see what, you, I can see the whiteboard, but I can't see anything that you're drawing on the whiteboard. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I do not know. Aha, there, there, you, there you go. Yeah, thanks. Better? Okay. Right. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> That'd be really embarrassing if I talked for five minutes and you couldn't see anything. No worries, that's all right. <laughs> okay, so... So I just drew a picture of a person. All these other little people are coming around asking uh, for your time, talent, and treasure. And you say yes to all of them. That's because we're very passive when it comes to our boundaries. And if you're like me, you keep getting those requests. Hopefully, you can see the other side here now, too. And you get more and more overcommitted, more and more overwhelmed, more and more frustrated and not being able to keep up. And you jump over to a different kind of behavior where you isolate yourself, you say no to everything, you, uh, you basically shut yourself off from the world as a way to escape all the commitments you've made. So we call this an aggressive boundary. I apologize for my lousy printing here, right? Think of somebody who's in a, a castle with a moat and they've pulled the drawbridge up and nobody can get in. And what we're gonna try and do today is talk about how do we find our way in the middle? And you gotta pretend this is a fence
You can think of this as our home. We're in the middle here. And we got a front door or a gate. And we get to control the gate. We decide who we let in and who we let out or who we keep out. So some people are allowed in, but there's others that are on the outside and that's fine. We just keep them on the outside. So this is all about being assertive with our boundaries. When you've got a fence around you and you control the gate, you're taking good care of yourself. You're doing self-care, you're setting up assertive boundaries. Most of us, to be honest, in, 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 as we get into CODA, we're over here. We get overwhelmed. We jump over to this side and we operate over here for a while. Sometimes we do ge uh, geographic cures, right? And we run away by moving to another place or we use COVID as an excuse and we lock our houses down and we don't let anybody in. You know, and then when we eventually recover, we jump back over here and uh, we behave in codependent ways by saying yes to everybody again. Um, and we don't know how to get to the middle. We just operate in the two extremes. So that's, we're gonna be talking a little bit about the left-hand side, the right-hand side, and how do we get to the middle? And I'll be doing that by sharing some of the information I've learned um, and also my experience, strength and hope. Oh, here we are. Okay, so just briefly, so what are personal boundaries? Well, those are the things that protect us, that we use them to protect ourselves and the things we value. And there's all kinds of personal boundaries, like physical, emotional boundaries, sexual boundaries, mental boundaries, spiritual, financial, uh, even the boundary of around having a freedom of choice. And, and that's always limited by society's boundaries. But what it comes down to is that boundaries are a necessary part of our relationships um, with others and with ourselves. You either have them or you don't, but they really are part of what define healthy relationships. And they're important because of our fifth tradition. They're a requirement for those healthy and loving relationships. We need them for safety. We need them for self-care. Uh, we need them because of our self-esteem and our self-love. If I matter, then I need to set up boundaries to protect myself, to take care of myself. Um, and equal partners communicate boundaries with each other. And by doing so, that leads to more trust and more vulnerability and greater intimacy. So for me, boundaries are a fundamental part of recovery. Learning how to have healthy boundaries makes a huge difference uh, in your relationships as you re recover. Uh, I'm going to talk about a concept here of responsibilities and burdens. Uh, this is an important thing to understand, um, and, and you'll see as I talk about it more, but responsibilities are those things in life that you as an individual are responsible for, right? Like, I'm responsible to get up in the morning, I'm responsible to feed myself, I'm responsible to get dressed, to go to work, to earn a living, uh, so that I have money to pay for my rent and, and my food. When I have kids at home, I have a responsibility to take care of those kids. Those are the things that my higher power expects me to do on a daily basis to take care of myself. They're not anybody else's responsibilities. They're my responsibilities. And, you know, it varies from person to person, depending on your mental and physical capabilities. Um, but in general, they're the things I am responsible for. So burdens are something else. So burdens are the things in life that you legitimately need help with, that you can't do on your own, and that your higher power never meant for you to face by yourself. And when you think of that, one of the obvious ones is recovery. We were not meant to recover on our own. CODA is not a self-help program. CODA is a program where we get together and share our experience, strength, and hope to help each other. It's a perfect example of a burden. My codependency is a burden in my life. It's bigger than I am. I need help with it. When my mom passed away last summer, um, that was a burden in my life. It was something that I couldn't just deal with by myself. 
I needed help with it. And it should be fairly obvious that when you've got things that are divided between responsibilities and burdens, there are things I need to take care of, and then there are things I need to ask for help with, right? And that's, that's how life is set up. And nobody ever explains that to us, but I found that to be really true. But there are boundary problems that occur because of this. So if I'm taking care of somebody else's responsibilities, the things that they need to be looking after, but if I'm taking care of them for them, that can cause problems. Uh, if I can't ask for help or won't ask for help when I'm struggling with a burden, when I'm struggling with my recovery, you know, I'm creating problems for myself by not being able to ask. If I'm the kind of person who controls and manipulates others so that they take care of my responsibilities, if I start using other people to look after the things I'm responsible for, that creates another kind of problem with boundaries. And when I'm unwilling to help others with their burdens, that leads to yet more problems, right, with, with boundaries. So that idea of responsibilities and burdens is really key to the boundary problems we have, right? If I'm not taking care of my responsibilities and I'm not asking for help with uh, my burdens, if I'm not helping other people with their burdens, or if I'm taking care of other people's responsibilities, those are all problems. And they're all the kinds of boundary problems that we all face as codependents. So um, what kind of problems are caused by poor boundaries? Well, if you look at our patterns, our compliance patterns, those are all about boundary problems, every last one of them. Um, we should all have that uh, information handy, so I won't go through it here. But other ones are, you know, we walk on eggshells in relationships. Uh, if we're unable to be ourselves with other people because we're afraid of them getting angry and we walk on eggshells as a result, that's a boundary problem. If we're unable to say no when we want to say no, that's a boundary problem. If we say yes because we feel guilt or shame, or somebody says you should say yes, so we say yes, that's a boundary problem. Uh, people with boundary problems like me are doormats. We're, we're doormats in relationships. We basically just do everything everybody else asks. It's like that passive person that I showed earlier. That person is a doormat. Um, in a relationship, when we have poor boundaries, we make our partner's wants and needs our wants and needs. We abandon our own needs and wants, and we take on other people's needs and wants, right? It becomes all about them. Um, we also tend to feel like we're constantly giving, hoping that at some point it'll be our turn to get something in return, but it is never our turn, partly because we never ask. We just keep giving, hoping that people will give back because that's what they're supposed to do, isn't it, right? And really what this all amounts to is we make other people our higher power. So I know I'm going kind of fast, um, but uh, there's a lot of slides here to cover. So I wanna make sure that uh, I get through a few of them, then we'll take uh, some questions. So why is it that us, we as codependents struggle with boundaries? Well, because fundamentally as a codependent, I believe I'm not enough. That somehow I'm fundamentally flawed, I'm less than, I don't measure up. And because I believe that about me, I need to be manipulative in the relationships I'm in because I desperately need those relationships and I don't want them to fail. So I start operating from a codependent point of view, hanging on to other people. I look to those other people for my sense of self-worth. So it's all about what everybody else thinks about me, not about what I think about myself. I need others and I cling to them and I refuse to do anything like setting a boundary because that might upset them. Um, and I'm afraid that they're gonna reject me and abandon me, right? So when I'm in a relationship, I'm using the other person to feel okay about me because I don't feel okay about myself. And I'm afraid to set boundaries with them because I'm afraid they're gonna reject me and abandon me. And as a codependent, that's the worst thing that can happen to me. That's my biggest fear, that I'm not enough 
and that they reinforce it by rejecting me and abandoning me. So that's why we don't set boundaries. Um, but we need to learn how to, how to have healthy boundaries. It's part of our recovery process. And hopefully in the meetings you go to, boundaries comes up as a subject every now and then. And we have a great pamphlet in Coda on boundaries. Uh, it's throughout our literature. But how do we learn to have better boundaries? Well, we've got to move from step one where we're powerless over others to that other side of step one, which is, well, if I'm powerless over our others, where do I have power? Well, the power is over me. I have power over me. And in recovery, I start looking at that power and trying to get healthier and to make good decisions. So I need to start owning my responsibilities and I need to stop trying to fix other people and let them be responsible for themselves. Um, we also take on a responsibility of being responsible to our partners as opposed to being responsible for them, right? And we have to accept that our choices have consequences. The reason I bring that up is because you can't have boundaries without consequences. And every time you set a boundary, there, there can be a consequence for yourself or for the other person or for both of you. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, if I'm gonna set a boundary with somebody, I need to back that up. If somebody is behaving in a disrespectful way towards me, and I finally find the courage and the energy to tell them I won't accept that behavior anymore, there can be consequences, right? They might get violent. They might get angry at me. They might ignore my request so, so what's the consequence going to be? How am I going to respond to them breaking my boundary? Well, hopefully we're strong enough that before we set the boundary, we figured out what we're going to do, where we're going to go if this person behaves in an inappropriate way when I try to set the boundary. How am I going to leave? How am I going to get, how am I going to be safe? Am I going to keep reinforcing this boundary every time this person gets angry at me and say, I'm not going to accept that unacceptable behavior and I'm going to walk out the door or I'm going to hang up the phone if I'm on the phone with you? You know, how do we look after ourselves by setting these boundaries and then having consequences for them? This is a quotation from Abraham Lincoln. I think it's great. It says, the worst thing you can do for those you love is the things that they could and should do for themselves. And when you do that, when you take responsibility for other people's responsibilities, you really mess up relationships. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, I'm thinking I might go a little bit longer for take the first break for questions. Uh, hopefully that's okay with everybody. I feel like I'm kind of getting through um, some of the, I, I don't want to call it academic stuff, but some of the the rules and guidelines, and uh, I'll give people a chance to ask questions in a few more minutes after a few more slides. So one of the things we have to do in recovery when we're thinking about boundaries is we need to start looking at our motives. So why am I taking care of other people's responsibilities? What is it in me that leads me to want to do that? And, and what I've found, and certainly this has come up in our meetings up here when we talk about it, is uh, we can do things for other people um, and those actions can either be right or wrong depending on our motives. Why am I doing it? It's not so much what the action is, but what's driving me to do that? Am I helping this person out because I want their approval? Because I need their approval? Or am I helping this person out out of a genuine sense of care and compassion? Um, early in recovery, I would have told you I'm always helping people out out of care and compassion because that's the kind of person I am. But once I got into recovery and I started looking at my motives, I started to understand that a big part, one of my defects of character was getting approval from other people. And I did that by trying to help them. But my motive on the surface might have looked good, but really it was all about my codependency, my need 
to suck approval out of those other people, to be a people pleaser, uh, as opposed to somebody who is doing something because it was the right thing to do. So I need to look at my motives, what's going on inside of me, because I've got to move from a place of people pleasing or saying yes out of fear to a place where I start to make the choice to give out of love and gratitude. If I'm giving a gift to somebody of my time, talent, or treasure, do I have strings attached? Do I expect something in return? Am I doing it because I need their approval? Or am I okay if they do nothing in return? By definition, a gift has no strings attached, right? So I've got to be really careful when I choose to give, am I giving with no strings attached? And if there are strings attached, I need to be honest about that, right? If I'm volunteering to babysit for somebody else, is that okay if they never babysit for me in return? Or do I actually want them sometime down the road to give me something back? And if that's the case, then I need to ask. So it's wrong of me to do a favor for somebody else asking for something in return if I don't say anything. That's very unhealthy behavior. It's very codependent behavior. If I want something in return, that's okay. I just need to communicate with that other person what I want in exchange. So I gotta be clear, am I giving a gift, no strings attached? Or am I asking for something exchange that in exchange? I'm happy to do it, but this is what I need from you in return. And I gotta be clear about that. Um, if I don't voice that I want something in return, I'm just setting myself up for a resentment. That's all I'm doing. It's an expectation and expectations we know lead to resentments. Uh, I also find I need to look at my feelings. Um, before I got into CODA, all I felt was anger, fear, uh, lonely, separate, different, angry, and afraid. I had a very limited range of feelings. Um, but as I got further into CODA, um, I realized that my feelings were tools that my higher power had given me to help me. It's okay to be afraid in a situation where fear is healthy and helps me look after myself. It's okay to be angry in a situation where I might be threatened and I need to protect myself. But by looking at my feelings, I can get a clue as to what's going on around me. Lots of times I feel things before I understand what's going on. And that's been my experience. So for me, if I'm feeling a resentment, I often feel it, I don't know where it's coming from. I have to sit down and, and think about it. And often what I've found is it's somebody violating one of my boundaries, somebody pushing my buttons, asking me to do things, uh, or beating around the bush, hoping that I'm gonna say yes to something. Um, resentments happen in me often when somebody is violating a boundary and I haven't realized that's what's going on yet. Um, fear. So why am I feeling fear when that comes up? What's going on? What is it I'm afraid of? Do I need to set a boundary with some somebody? If my son is out late at night and he doesn't contact me, I used to get really angry about that. And under the anger, I found there was fear. And the fear originated from my family of origin. I had a sister who went out one night and was murdered. And she was gone all night. We didn't know where she was. My parents reacted. They didn't know what was going on. And when I realized I was getting angry with my son, uh, I understood that there was fear underneath because I didn't know where he was. And I couldn't help but think about my sister, right? And the fact that she had been out late one night and, and had not come home. So I needed to set a boundary with my son that if you're gonna be out, I need you to contact me and let me know when you're gonna be in. So I'm not worried sick about you, right? So I need to look at that emotion. You know, there's other reasons I may have fear uh, because maybe somebody's 
interacting with me using unacceptable behavior? And, and am I just freezing because of the fear when I need to move through that fear and set a boundary with this person and say, that's unacceptable behavior, right? And then figure out how do I look after myself when somebody is behaving that way? Envy is a really interesting one. Uh, if I'm feeling envious, I hear somebody sharing about something they've got that makes me feel envious. Maybe they've got a new car. Maybe they've got a really interesting job. Maybe they've got friends, more friends than I have that they hang around with and have fun with. And I'm envious because it's hard for me to have those relationships. So do I want something? Well, maybe I need to set a boundary with myself. Look at what that envy is all about and say, okay, how do I work on getting that thing that I want? It's unreasonable for me to expect it just to fall in my lap. I need to work at doing what I need to do to look after that because it's my need, it's my want. Uh, I can't just be envious of other people and what they've got. I've got to figure out how do I get my needs met? And often what I've found that when I examine the envy and what's going on, you know, it's easy for me to make a decision. Is that really important to me or not? And if it's really important to me, I start working on it. Um, if it's not really important to me, then I realize oh, I'm envious for nothing, you know, and I can let it go. So one of the things that certainly I as a codependent have struggled with uh, is that fear to speak what's in my, on my mind. And it all goes back to that idea of um, we don't want to rock the boat in our relationships. We're afraid of the rejection. We're afraid of the response we're going to get. We're afraid of angry people, right? So we're afraid to open our mouths and say anything that might get a response that we don't want. But boundaries need open, honest communication. Good relationships need open, honest communication. We need to act when we start learning about boundaries and we start setting boundaries, because we've got to make those boundaries clear before other people can respect them, right? If I don't tell you about a boundary, how can I expect you to honor my boundary? It makes sense logically, but we've got that huge fear inside of us about telling other people where we're drawing the line because we're afraid of their rejection. So one of the things we have to get through uh, is learning how to communicate uh, before we can make progress with our boundaries. All right, so I'm gonna jump into my experience, strength and hope, and hopefully expand on some of the things I said before. Um, so I have to say my sponsor was the first person who modeled good boundaries for me. Um, when I first asked my sponsor to sponsor me, uh, and I'm talking about my first sponsor, he said to me, I would be happy to be your sponsor. Um, we're gonna set up a few ground rules. First rule you need to know is, it is your job to pick up the phone and call me when you need to talk. It's not your job to guess whether I'm available or not. He said that because he wanted it to be clear to me, I had to pick up the phone. And it was up to him to say whether the time was convenient or not. And if the time wasn't convenient, he committed to telling me when he would be able to talk to me in the near future. So right away, he set that boundary with me, pick up the phone. Because as codependents, the last thing I wanna do is be a bother to somebody else, you know? And so I use that as an excuse not to reach out and ask for help. Uh, he insisted my job was to ask for help. Um, I also learned I had to start with baby boundaries. Um, and, and codependency is like having that devil on your shoulder that's whispering in your ear all the time. When it comes to setting a boundary, that devil on your shoulder is gonna whisper to you that they're going to leave, they're going to break up with you, they're going to be angry, that if you set this boundary, that'll be the end of the relationship, right? That fear is really strong. Um, and when you first start setting boundaries, and for quite a long time afterwards, you're going to have that fear, that guilt. Maybe you're going to have some shame involved in that too, because you didn't set boundaries in the past, and you allowed the situation to evolve to the point where it was terrible, 
and you really needed to set the boundary, but it was kind of too late in a sense. Um, so you start with baby boundaries. And, and what somebody encouraged me to do was when you get somebody who phones you saying they want to sell something, uh, you say no thanks and you hang up the phone. <laughs> and that's the first place to start setting boundaries because you don't know them. You'll never run into them. There'll be no consequence, right? It's the safest place to start saying no. You don't want to talk to them anyway. So allow yourself when they call and you find out it's a, somebody asking to do a poll or whatever, just say, no, thanks, that doesn't work for me and hang up. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to react. You can just say, no, thanks, that doesn't work for me. Um, so I learned I had to start with baby boundaries. I had to start working my boundary muscles because of the fear, the guilt and the shame, because I was afraid to say no because of the consequences that I thought would happen. So start with little simple things and start there. The more uh, intimate the relationship, the harder it will be for you to set boundaries, right? So you've got to start with easy places to set those boundaries. Um, and the reason I need to start setting boundaries is because I'm learning in recovery that I have to do self-care. I have to start valuing me. I have to start accepting me. Almost all of us get into recovery uh, with the sense that we're not good enough, that we don't count, we're not matter, we don't matter. Uh, we get here with a lot of self-loathing. Um, and part of recovery, although we don't always talk about it this way, is you've got to go from self-loathing to self-love. And that's a long distance for those of us who are just getting into recovery. Um, and we don't know how to do it. But when we can accept unconditional love from the group and unconditional support from the group, when we can see others valuing us just the way we are, then we can start to value ourselves. And we need to start doing that because if I value myself, that's what gives me the motivation to take care of myself and to set boundaries to keep myself safe, to look after my wants and needs. Um, before I set a boundary, I ask myself, how important is it, right? One of the things I found early in recovery is uh, I need to start setting boundaries. And I immediately try to set boundaries everywhere. Um, and then I fail because I'm, I'm going at it the wrong way. I have to look at where is it important for me to set a boundary? And where is it not important? Um, the longer I'm in recovery, uh, the less important a lot of things are. Things that used to irritate me uh, I can let go of a lot more easily, right? So it's not important for me to set boundaries there anymore. But then I can see that with this person who's uh, exhibiting unacceptable behaviors when they're angry and they're smashing at the windows or smashing at the doors whenever they get angry and it's in my house, you know, I can say that's an acceptable behavior. This is my house. I am responsible for looking after my things you do not have the right to come in here and damage my stuff. I need to set that boundary with you. So that's an important boundary. The other thing I always ask myself is, what is the worst thing that can happen? And the reason I ask myself is so that I can think it through. If I set this boundary, what's the worst thing that can happen? If I don't set the boundary, what's the worst thing that can happen? If I set, if maybe this person is in my house, they're being angry, they're damaging things, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, maybe they might get angry at me. Maybe I need to protect myself. Do I know what I'm going to do to protect myself when I set this boundary? Or do I need to be aware that I might have to call the police? Do I know what number I'm gonna dial? Do I know where my phone is? So I've got it handy just in case, right? If I can think about what's the worst thing that can happen and I can be okay with that worst thing, then I'm prepared. Uh, and almost all the time, the worst thing is far worse in my head than reality. You know, I have found that the worst thing that can happen often is generated by my fears, you know, what I think the worst thing is going to be, but it never turns out to be that bad. But by having thought about what's the worst thing that can happen, I'm prepared and I'm okay if it goes that way. 
and I don't have to react. I'm just ready to respond because I've already thought about how I'm going to respond. Uh, as we said before, a boundary isn't a boundary without a consequence. Um, when people show consistency in honoring your boundaries, you don't usually have to worry about the consequences as much. But uh, when you're first starting to set boundaries, people are going to push back because you're changing the rules in your relationship. Maybe they've been controlling you the whole time in this relationship, and suddenly you're trying to set boundaries. Well, usually what those people do is they push back harder because they want the relationship, the, the, the rut that you're in to stay because they're benefiting from it, right? So they're going to push harder. So you need to have that consequence uh, and let them know what it's going to be. And you need to be prepared to follow through on that consequence. So what's the worst thing that can happen if I tell my partner that I don't like that it's all about them, that there isn't an equal say for me? I want you to hear what I have to say. I want us to spend half the time on my wants and needs and half the time on yours. And you say, no, that doesn't work for me. Well, I've got to be prepared to say, well, then this relationship isn't going to work for me. And maybe we need to take a break. So I said before, need to practice. Expect to make mistakes when you start setting consequences. I, I had this rule for myself. There's this idea of a, give, a gimme in golf where uh, I don't golf, but my understanding is that you allow yourself one mistake and you don't count it against yourself, right? So I learned that I always needed to give me a gimme before I looked at my mistakes because mistakes are ine inevitable when we're learning something new. It's how we grow and it's how we learn, right? So I need to be okay knowing that I'm not gonna do it perfectly. And, that, and that's fine, right? I also have to expect that I'm gonna receive pushback or be reacted to, but by having thought about what's the worst that can happen, I can be prepared for that. Uh, remember, like I said, start small. It does take courage and practice to set boundaries, right? So you need to get support from your sponsor. You need to get support from your group sometimes. You need to talk to those you trust. Um, I had to make a very significant boundary with my um, wife that I was separated from at the time. She wanted financial support to live apart from me. And my codependency said, yeah, I have to do this for her. And I was talking to my therapist that I had who was helping me with boundaries because that's how afraid I was to set boundaries. My therapist was saying, don't just give her the support. What do you want in return? What, what do you need in this relationship? And I realized I wanted access to my kids. So she said, okay, set the boundary. Say you're happy to support her financially because half your money is hers anyway, but you want access to the kids half time make that request, set that boundary that you won't help her unless she accepts that. And I was scared stiff to set that boundary. And I had to talk to the therapist several times beforehand. I talked to my sponsor and I'd arranged to talk to those people again right after I set the boundary. So I knew that after I set the boundary, I had a safe place to go to talk about it and to, to release some of the emotion, you know? And I got a very negative reaction um, she basically hung up the phone on me. But then when it came time to her needing those finances later in the month, uh, she phoned me back and said, I've been thinking about it. And yes, if you provide me with the financial support I need to live separately, I will give you access to the children without fighting on that. Right? So that's, we often need support. And the more significant the boundary, the more support we need. Um, so boundaries do change the rules and relationships, right? Uh, you start, um, if somebody's been doing all the dominating the relationship, basically controlling the relationship, when you start setting boundaries, you're saying it's kind of like a mobile. You're, you're moving the mobile and the mobile is going to swing around for a while. Often the other person reacts because you're changing the rules and they don't understand what the new rules are going to be because they're not used to having a relationship that involves boundaries. Um, so 
Boundaries do change the rules and relationships. And I honestly have learned that if you can set boundaries and have the other person um, honor your boundaries, they can set boundaries with you and you can honor them. And it leads to greater intimacy in those relationships. Those relationships become safer. You can be more vulnerable. You can be more intimate because both sides can express their needs and wants and have them met. They know they can trust their partner to honor the boundaries and to ask for new boundaries when they see something that's not going right. So the relationship, there's communication. You know what's working for both people and what's not acceptable for both people. Uh, with my girlfriend that I have now, early in our relationship, she said to me, I think it's really important, is what she said, that we talk about the deal breakers in our relationship early on. And as a codependent, I was very scared and didn't know what she really meant. So she said, my boundaries are, if you cheat on me, if you lie to me, that's the end of the relationship. And then she said something really impressive to me. She said, what are your deal breakers? Right? So she wasn't setting a boundary at me. She was stating what she, was, what she needed to protect herself. And then she allowed me to state what I needed to protect myself. So it's a great example of how you can't use boundaries to control other people, but you use boundaries to protect yourself. You're just letting other people know, other people know where that boundary is so they can respect them or choose to respect them. And it's really important to allow other people to set boundaries with you. The coolest thing you can do with your kids is model boundaries with them. Set boundaries with them. And one day they're going to try and set a boundary with you. And if at all possible, try to honor that. Try to allow them to do that and encourage them to do that. Because boundaries aren't natural to us. We need other people to model that behavior for us so that we can start setting them for ourselves. If we live in a relationship, in relationships where nobody can set boundaries or everybody's a boundary buster, you just don't know how to interact with others with boundaries. But if you're in a relationship and you're seeing other people model healthy boundaries, you understand that's how relationships can work. That's how healthy relationships look. And that's part of healthy, legitimate relationships. Another thing you need to remember is you can't set a boundary and look after other people's feelings at the same time. It's unfortunate, but you set a boundary to look after yourself. You can't set a boundary and look after the other person while you're setting the boundary. Um, and it's just something to be aware of. You're not setting a boundary to try and harm somebody or hurt somebody, but you're setting the boundary because you need to do it for you. Right? And sometimes other people are hurt by that, but that, that can be okay. Uh, my mother used to want to talk to me all about my ex-wife all the time when we were on the phone. And I had to finally set a boundary with her and say, look, mom, if you're going to insist on, on talking about her, I'm going to end the conversation. And she was very upset with me. And one day it was going on and I told her, you're talking about my ex again. I'm just going to let you know that I'm going to hang up the phone now. And uh, we can talk again next week after we both had a chance to kind of think about this. And I hung up the phone. She was very upset, but she learned to not bring it up, to let that go so that we could have conversations. Right? So um, I like this author. He writes some self-help books. Um, that, that I like to read. Um, and, and this quote from him is, when you say yes to others, make sure you're not saying no to yourself, right? By saying yes and not thinking about how it impacts you, you're actually saying no to yourself. You're denying yourself something. So it's been really important to me to learn how to say yes um, out of abundance. And, and we'll get into that shortly here. So, before saying yes, and, and I want to thank Karen Kay for this, uh, these are the four key questions that you should ask yourself before you, you say yes to somebody, before you offer to help somebody. So did they ask for the help? 
If they didn't ask for the help, why am I doing it? Am I interfering? Am I meddling? Is it my business? Am I trying to take responsibility for somebody else's responsibilities? So if they didn't ask for it, I need to be very careful before I do something for somebody else. Um, is it necessary? Right? Is, it, is this a necessary thing they're asking for help with? Or is it really their responsibility? Right? It's that question of, are they asking because it's a burden? Or are they asking and it's a responsibility and they just want me to take care of them? Will it be appreciated? And how am I going to feel if they don't respond um, by thanking me, right? Am I going to be OK uh, doing this for them if they don't even acknowledge the fact that I've done it for them and say thank you? How have they behaved in the past when I've helped them, right? How am I going to feel? Is this going to lead to resentment on my part? If it's going to lead to resentment on my part because of poor past behavior, maybe I need to say no. Maybe I need to set that boundary and say, you know, I'd really like to help you, but I've found in my experience that I've helped you in the past. You know, you don't say thank you. You don't appreciate it. And frankly, I don't have to do this. I think you need to find somebody else who can help you. And the last question is, can I afford it? Right? And that's not just financially afford it, but can I afford the time? Can I afford the energy? Um, can I look after myself and do this too? So if I've evaluated these things, then maybe I can consider saying yes. Um, and I, I, I don't see it here. There's one statement maybe I've edited out because of the uh, shortening the slides, but it's when I'm free to say no, when I have the freedom to say no and I can say no, then I have the freedom to say yes. If I don't have the freedom to say no, then I'm saying yes out of my codependency. Do I have the freedom to stay in the relationship I want and I'm in right now? Can I walk away from it if it's not healthy? If my answer is no, then I need to look at that relationship. Why am I still there? If I can't say no to somebody because I'm afraid uh, that'll end the relationship, well, I'm not in a very healthy place, right? So to, it's really important to get to a place where your yes means yes, and you're not saying yes, but you want to say no. And saying yes because you're free to say yes means you're giving a gift. It's coming out of your abundance. Um, if your cup is empty, if you have very little to give, it's really hard to give a gift of, of time and energy of, of love, right? But when you're taking care of yourself, you've got more of that time, energy, and love to give. And the gift is really a gift then. No strings attached. You're, you're doing it because you want to, and it's the right thing to do, and you don't expect anything in return. Being able to give a gift that way, being able to say yes that way is huge. It, it changes relationships. Uh, doing this boundaries workshop, uh, I often talk about giving these workshops as uh, me being freely able to say yes out of abundance. And I often feel like I'm doing my higher powers well when I can give that way, right? So being able to get there is really important. So uh, one of the things I learned was if my kids or somebody else came up to me and said spot uh, on the spur of the moment, Dad, I need, I need you to give me $50, right? And uh, I, need the, I need the money right away for something that's going on. I don't have it. Uh, and I'll pay you back later. If somebody puts a demand on me like that, I have learned to say I need time to think about it. And then if they insist that they need an answer right away, my response I've learned is to say no. And I say, if you need an answer right away, it's gonna to have to be no. But if you'll let me think about it, I will consider your request, your request and I'll let you know tomorrow morning whether I can do it or not. But if you need the answer right now, it's gonna to have to be no, because I need the time to think about it. Um, and then, if you need to be a broken record about it when you're setting a boundary with somebody, 
do that. Use the same words, the same language over and over again. Give them the same response every time. Be that broken record. Sorry, if you haven't, if you can't give me enough time to think about it, the answer is no. <laughs> Sorry, I know you really want it. But like I said before, if you need to know right now, the answer is no. I need time to think about it. If you can't give me time to think about it, then sorry, I can't help you, right? That set the boundary, say that, that that won't work for me. You don't have to explain why it doesn't work for you. Just say no and say, sorry, it won't work for me, right? And don't hum and haw, uh, just realize that by opening the door a little, People who like to control you will try to get in that crack that you've opened up and, and get you to say yes. They'll try to figure out how to manipulate you to say yes. So just be a broken record if you have to with your no, right? And it's, it's enough to say that won't work for me. Or you can just leave it as simple as no. Um, just checking the time here. Uh, Remember, no is a complete sentence. When you're free to say no, there it is. You are free to say yes. And I've already talked about that. Oh, and by the way, you can change your boundaries at any point in the future if you feel that's appropriate. It's up to you. So if you have been setting boundaries quite firmly with somebody, but they've been honoring those boundaries for a period of time, you can relax those boundaries a little bit <clears throat> because you know they're being trustworthy. But if somebody is pushing you consistently and they're not honoring your boundaries and you have a hard time with them, you're gonna to have to find the energy within you to keep being forceful with your boundaries, to keep establishing those boundaries. Don't let up, don't relax. Even though you might be tired of being that broken record, if you let a crack of the light through the door, they will pry that door wide open if you give them the chance. So just remember that if you have to be firm with your boundaries one day, it doesn't mean you have to be firm with them always. When they show that they're willing to be trustworthy, then you can consider maybe relaxing the, the relationship, uh, the boundaries, but that's up to you. Um, I've also learned that when I, uh, I need to ask for help, like we talked about with um, burdens, I need to ask for help to look after me. But when I ask for help, I allow them to say no. I will often say to people, I need to ask you a favor, feel free to say no if it doesn't work for you, but this is what I wanna ask. So especially with people who are codependent, I tell them they have the option to say no and it's okay to say no when I ask. It allows them to be more comfortable saying no. Um, also, I found I'm more comfortable setting other people uh, boundaries with other people, just because I know I need to do it to protect me. And I'm encouraging them also to set boundaries with me. It's boundaries are a two way street. And I try to help others be more comfortable. But I've also become more comfortable myself and setting them over time. So what are some of the gifts I've received from boundaries? Um, so these are the gifts I feel I've gotten by learning how to have healthier boundaries with myself and with others. So I've found it easier to detach with love from other people. If other people are having a bad day, because I feel safe in the relationship, because we have healthy boundaries with one another, it allows me to let them have a bad day. And I don't feel like the relationship is threatened. I don't feel like I have to fix the other person. I can just say something like, wow, it sounds like you're having a bad day. If there's anything I can do to help, just let me know and leave it at that. Um, and this goes along with it. I learned to mind my own business more. My codependency tends to make me want to jump in and help other people. And that's that need for approval. Um, but because I'm more aware now that people have their own responsibilities and need to take care of them, that I'll actually be harming them if I take their responsibilities from them, then it's easier for me to mind my own business and let them look after their own responsibilities. That obviously goes along with feeling less responsible for others. Uh, I tend to overcommit myself much less than I used to 
because I'm much more aware of what I can afford emotionally, physically. Um, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm glad that the committee is patient with me. They have been talking to me since the fall about doing this boundaries workshop. And I have been struggling, languishing between my mother passing away, between COVID, between other things in my life. I have kind of been able to engage and then not able to engage. So um, just being aware of where we're at and what we have to give is really important. So we set boundaries uh, with ourselves and with others so that we can take care of ourselves. Um, I have much less fear of rejection than I used to. Like I used to, I, I didn't date people. I took hostages, if I were to be honest. I wouldn't let them go, right? Uh, I was afraid once I was going out with somebody that they would reject me. So I would hang on for dear life. But I'm much less afraid of that now. I'm much more interested in an equal relationship with healthy boundaries than in just being in a relationship. Um, so I've been able to let go of using other people to get my needs met. And, and I'm less afraid of rejection as a result because I know I'll be okay, even if this isn't the right relationship for me. I also find I have a lot more time for self-care and to look after the things I want than I used to because I know how important it is for me to look after me. So I, again, I overcommit less, which leads to doing more self-care uh, and less looking after everybody else. So more gifts from Boundaries. Um, my new and renewed relationships are with equal partners. Healthy boundaries bring more equality and more uh, intimacy in relationships. And uh, there's our five minute warning. Okay, and I'll go back to my presentation. Um, I have a deeper relationships with those who are trustworthy. We, as we learn to trust those who are trustworthy because I can set boundaries with them and I know they can set boundaries with me. So it's clear what the parameters on the relationship are. I find I can accept others more easily because I'm less judgmental um, and more accepting. And I've, I've, as I've said many times, boundaries are like the litmus test of a relationship. If you can have healthy relation, boundaries within your relationship, it, it's, it's great. It leads to greater greater love and intimacy. Um, and, and it has led me to more self-love, more acceptance of myself the way I am. Um, and it helps me know when I need to set boundaries. So there's lots of resources uh, in CODA with regards to boundaries. There's the patterns of codependency, the 12 steps, the 12 traditions. CODA, so the traditions were created to help relationships. And because we're all about relationships in CODA, the traditions are gold to us. Please look at that because it's wonderful. The blue book, your sponsor can really help you with boundaries. Uh, we have a boundaries pamphlet. The In This Moment Daily Reader uh, has lots on boundaries. And you can help yourself by chairing a meeting on boundaries. Even if you feel like you know nothing about them, pick that as the topic. Pick a couple of readings. See what other people have to say. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. This is our closing prayer. And why don't we all say yeah. it together? Yes. Yes. All right. And Ian, all right. if you'd like to join us. Mm -hmm. We thank our higher power for all that we have received from this meeting. As we close, may we take with us the wisdom, love, acceptance, and hope of recovery. Keep coming back. It here. works if you're worth it, and you're worth it. <laughs> <laughs>